Thank you so much, everybody, and guten Morgen, UICONF. Everyone feeling good? Yeah. All right, perfect. Uh, so yeah, my name is John Sundell. I am super, super excited to be here today. Uh, I'm primarily an iOS developer, but I also run a weekly blog and podcast called Swift by Sundell. And today, I am uh, very excited to talk to you about UI testing and how it can be a little bit of a magical technology. And I mean that both in the sense that it can be fun and exciting, and I also mean it in the sense that it can be confusing, unpredictable, and you really don't know what's going on. So let's dive right in. Today, we're going to talk about a bunch of different things. And we're going to start by going through the basics of UI testing. Because I know there's going to be a lot of people in the audience who have never, ever written a single UI test. And I know also there's going to be some people in the audience who have written a lot of UI tests. So I'm going to try to give you something as well. So we're going to talk a lot about how we can make our UI tests more stable and faster and scale better as our team grows and as our number of tests grows as well. I call these the classic three S's, speed, stability, and scalability. Uh, along the way, I'm going to aim to give you as many tips and tricks as I can. And today, we're going to focus primarily on Xcode's built-in UI testing framework. I know there's probably a bunch of you who have like your favorite third-party testing framework. Maybe you use KIF, maybe you use Facebook snapshot testing, or Earl Grey from Google. Uh, those are all great, but we're going to focus on Xcode's UI testing today just as a, as a kind of baseline. But I think a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about today are going to apply to those other frameworks as well. So when we talk about UI testing, the first question we really need to ask ourselves is like how it fits into our overall testing strategy, if we even have one. So when we do testing and automated testing, uh, we usually start with unit tests. And unit tests are a great way to verify that a single class or a single function does what we expect it to do. So we give it some input, usually it's some kind of mock predictable input, and then we verify that the right output comes back. So that is a great way to verify one single piece of our code base, one unit, in isolation. But it's not enough. Because as we all know, even if we write the perfect class, you know, the perfect function, it's beautiful, follows all the naming conventions, still things can go wrong. And this is why we also need integration tests. We're actually taking our unit, our single class or function, and we're using it in context. And that way, we can also catch some edge cases. We can see when things can go wrong in other places in our app. But those, both of these kind of tests are also still very artificial. We're setting up the environment. We're mocking things. So it's still not really real. Our, our users are not using the app like we are doing in unit, unit tests or UI tests. We need to actually use things more in a real environment. And that's why we need end-to-end -end tests in order to actually use our entire app from our class that we wrote up until the UI that gets rendered on the screen and interactions that happen. So the question then becomes, where do UI tests fit into this kind of scheme? Where do we place them? Well, I think a good place to start is to take a look at kind of the fundamental difference between UI tests and some other type of tests. So let's say we're building an app which lets our users list their favorite cities in the world. You know, we have Berlin there at the top, of course, right? And then we have all of our other, other cities as well. So if we wanted to write a unit test against one of the classes that we use here, let's say we want to unit test our view model, we might write something like this, where what we do is we load a local JSON file, we call it cities mock, we decode our view model from it, and then we verify that the right number of cities is returned, and that the title for the first city, in this case Berlin, is correct. So in this case, we have some input at the top, which is our JSON mock. And we verify the output by verifying the properties and the return types from our function calls. And that's like a classic kind of u u unit test kind of way of doing things. But when we use UI tests, things are a bit different. Here, we're no longer getting code level access to our app. Instead, we need to actually interact with the UI. We need to click things, and we need to verify the things that get rendered. So a U UI test ends up looking pretty different. As you can see here, the first thing we do is actually launch our application. We create an instance of XC UI application, which acts as a bridge between our UI test and the actual application running the real thing in the iOS simulator. 
In order to verify things, we need to start by tapping something. And then to verify the outcome there at the bottom, we, don't no, we no longer check like properties on a view model, but instead we check the actually rendered UI. In this case, I'm verifying that when I tap on a table view cell, there's a new view controller pushed, which is going to change the title of the navigation bar to Krakow in this case. So the input here is different. It's a tap instead of an actual function call. And the output is the actual state of the UI itself. So that's kind of a different way of thinking when you're writing UI tests versus other types of tests. So if you go back and look at this uh, chart here that we had from before, the different kind of buckets of tests that we might have in our app, where UI tests fit in, one way of looking at this chart is the more we go to the right, the more time it takes to run these tests, and usually the more complex they are. Actually interacting with our real app is a lot more complex than just creating an instance of a class and just verifying it in isolation. But at the same time, when doing end-to-end -end testing, we get a lot more real results because unit tests and integration tests are a lot more artificial. It doesn't mean that they're not valuable. They're very, very valuable. And because they're a lot more faster to run, that's very good as well. But the more we go to the right and the more we use our real app in a real context, the more real verifications we can make. And this is really where UI tests come in, where we can use them to make sure that our app works in a more real life situation. But because it stands there all the way to the right, and it takes a lot of time to run, and it tends to be kind of complex, there's a lot of different opinions about UI tests in the community. Some people, they don't really like UI tests. They think that UI tests are a waste of time, they're slow, they're unstable, and they don't add much value at all. Better avoid them, you know? Delete that UI testing target, we don't need it. But some other people, they're at the other side of the spectrum, and they feel like this. UI tests, they're amazing. Every corner of the app should be covered with tests. TDD for life, right? Well, I mean, you can have both of these uh, opinions, of course, and they're both valid. You're, you can think whatever you want. Uh, but to explain to you kind of how I think about these things and how I tend to approach them, I actually need to give you a little bit of a Swedish language lesson. So I want to introduce you to my favorite Swedish language in the world. So Swedish is my native language. And we have a word in Swedish which I really like, and it's called lagom. Lagom, it doesn't have a direct translation into English, but what it essentially means is that it's not too much and it's not too little. So if someone asks you, how much ketchup do you want on your burger? You can just say lagom. Easy, right? I think this word here explains a lot of Swedish culture, actually. <laughs> so when it comes to testing, uh, you know, people, they always say that they do TDD, you know, TDD, test-driven development, is awesome. But whenever I think about doing TDD, I don't think about test-driven development, I think about tactically deployed development. I want to tactically deploy my tests wherever they make the most sense, wherever I get the biggest bang for the buck, and whenever I can use something like UI test to verify some parts of the app that I might not be you know, often verifying myself manually, testers might miss it easily, or it might be time consuming and hard to test manually. For example, some of these use cases might be the login flow or the onboarding screen of your app or the core UI interactions that you might have. And these are all things that maybe require a bunch of state in order to set up. They can be hard, uh, hard to do every single time, like for example, onboarding, which we only see the first time we launch the app after installing it. And the core UI interactions are really important to keep high quality because that's the reason our users use the app in the first place. So let's go in and take a look at an example. Let's dive a little bit deeper into onboarding. Let's say we want to add an onboarding screen to our favorite Cities app, where we give the user a little warm welcome, and we show them a label explaining a little bit about the app, and they have a button to get started. So again, because the screen is only displayed under one single condition, the first time the user launches the app after installing it, it's kind of easy to have regressions in the screen. Let's say I'm making a completely unrelated change in a different part of the app. Let's say we have a UI library, like a you know, shared components, or we might have like an auto layout helper, and I'm making some, some tweaks in that. And what, what ends up happening is this. The, the button all of a sudden appears underneath the text. 
Now, this is pretty bad because that means the button won't be able to be tapped, right? The users can't even get to the app. Did you see the onboarding screen? Welcome to favorite cities. Well, thank you, but can I please use the app? No, I'm sorry, because the button is hidden from you. So this is something we, of course, want to avoid. So how can we use UI tests in order to actually give us a little bit of an insurance policy so we can sleep sounder at night, not having to worry about our onboarding screen? So we can do something like this. We can start by creating an, an instance of, or a subclass of XC test case, which is Xcode's test case class, and we implement a test called test onboarding. Now, just like in our example before, the first order of business is to launch the app, you know, to actually launch the UI test and get started. The first thing we want to do here is we want to make sure that we're actually rendering the title that we expect. So again, we can't verify that we have like a certain view controller on the screen. We can't verify that we have a certain view model. Instead, we have to actually verify that this specific label appears on the screen. So here I'm testing that welcome to favorite cities actually exists on the screen. Then I perform the action, which in this case is I grab the button. Again, I grab it by the rendered title, in this case, get started, and I tap it. And what I expect then is for the onboarding screen to be dismissed. So I expect that no longer, the title no longer exists in the UI. So after that is done, the, the, I assert false that the title exists. And that should be good enough, right? So this, this uh, might seem like a very simple test, but it's actually really useful because the next time that this thing happens, that I or someone else on my team accidentally makes this regression, we're going to get a test failure. And of course, we're talking about Xcode, and Xcode always gives us so helpful, nice error messages. So of course, we get this here as well. Failed to scroll to visible by AX action button, some weird number. It could have just said, your UI is broken, go fix it, right? That would be just as helpful. So uh, yeah, that's what we need to do. We need to fix this, and then we get back to the initial state. But the, here comes a problem. So even though this test looks simple, it looks good, it actually has a couple of different problems. And the first thing we're going to encounter is the very next time we actually run this test, we're going to start seeing a failure. And we're going to see a failure here, that our assert true actually failed. And this is the point in time where most iOS developers will start blaming Xcode. Oh, this is Xcode's fault. You know, the test was succeeding the first time, so this is clearly an infrastructure problem. Go rant on Twitter. Xcode sucks. You know, this is very, very common. But actually, this is not Xcode's fault. It's our fault. So if you run the app again in the simulator, we're going to see something interesting. We're going to see this. We're going to actually see our screen, like the actual list of cities. We don't see the onboarding anymore. Well, if you think about it, this kind of makes sense, because you only see the onboarding once when you first launch the app. So the problem here is that we have some state that the test is not aware of. And essentially, what we're encountering here is our very first meeting with flakiness. This is something that every single person who has ever written a test has probably encountered. And this is what happens when you have some test that only succeeds or fails under certain conditions. In our case, it only succeeds the first time because the onboarding state is clean, and then afterwards it continues failing. It basically, that we have some unpredictable state that our UI test is not aware of, so it can't know whether it's supposed to show the onboarding screen or not. There's a couple of ways to address this. We can either add more state to our test. It's usually not a good idea because it makes the test harder to understand and like, less deterministic. What I like to do about these kind of things is I like to reset my app state. I want to make sure that when I run my test, it starts from a clean slate so things are more predictable. And the way I usually do that is that in the test, I actually add a launch argument to when launching the app. In this case, I just call it dash reset. And that way, I can tell my app that it should reset itself when it first launches. Then I can put a little simple method in the app delegate when the app actually launches, and I can check the command line arguments if it contains this flag. And if it's there, in this, in this app, I'm using user defaults as the best database, right? I take the user defaults, and I just clean them out. And that way, I can make sure that I start from a clean slate. So that's not only the source of flakiness that you're likely to encounter when you're working with UI tests. There are many of them. And I want to highlight two more. And the second one is content changes. When we're working with modern apps, a lot of the content that we have is very dynamic. It can change quickly. It can come from the server. It can come from user input. It can you know, be some copywriter that's working on our team that is changing texts. 
And the way we did this before here in our test is that we retrieve the elements based on the render text. Well, that's a problem if your content is dynamic, and this is a very common source of flakiness. But the good news is it's easy to fix. Xcode's UI testing framework is actually built right on top of accessibility, which means that we can use accessibility identifiers in order to identify our elements. In this case, I'm going to give the title of my onboarding screen the onboarding.title and the button onboarding.button. And that way, I can just update my queries in my tests to instead just use the accessibility identifiers. And that way, my content changes will not affect my tests. And my copy editors or you know, backend developers or whatever it might be, they are free to iterate on the app without me having to update my tests, which is usually a good idea. The final source of flakiness that is very, very common to encounter is waiting times. Let's say that we want to add a new feature to our app where we let users uh, add new cities to the mix. That's a pretty core user interaction. So we want to have something that looks like this. We get a popover or an alert. We add a city, and then we press Done. And that way, it appears in the list. And we want to write a UI test that actually verifies that this core user interaction is working as expected. So we head over to Xcode. We again open uh, a new test, and we write a new test case. And we start with the same thing before. We, um, we create an XE UI application instance. And here I append another launch argument you can see here, which is called skip onboarding. And that's because I already verified onboarding in one of my other tests. So instead of having to do it one more time here, I just skip the onboarding instead. Since the UI on the screen tells me to tap in order to add my first city, all I need to do is just tap the app, and that way I should get the popover. To verify that, I'm just going to, again, use the accessibility identifier to get the add.name uh, text field, and I'm just going to type in Berlin in this case. To add it, I'm just going to get the add button, and I'm going to tap that, and that way Berlin should now appear in the list. So to verify that, this time I actually want to use the actual rendered UI because I want to verify that the right label appears on the screen. So to do that, I will make a query for getting the first cell. And again, here I'm using an accessibility identifier, city-0. That's a zero index cell. And then I verify that that cell has a label with the title Berlin with the emoji flag. So this is pretty straightforward. But now we write this test, and we run it. And all of a sudden, we see failure again. Our, our good old friend XCT assert true failed is back. Now it needs to be Xcode's problem, right? I mean, come on. We did everything we could. Well, if we capture this video from this test and we take a look at it, we can actually see what is going on here. So let's run the video. We can see that we I get the popover, uh, pop and then, oh no, it's Mr. Loading Spinner. What are we going to do here? We get a loading spinner. It's some asynchronous call because we need to call our server. So we actually have a delay here. We have some waiting time that we're not taking into account in our tests. And that way, we start again getting random failures. Now, an initial idea how to fix this might be, I know what I should do. Let's add some sleeping time. Let me just sleep a little bit, take a little nap, you know, a little power nap in the test. And that way, it's going to succeed. Well, the thing is that it might actually fix the problem, but it's a pretty bad solution. And the reason it's a bad solution is that, number one, you're making all of your tests slower. They're all going to just wait idly for two seconds. And you're not really fixing the flakiness in the first place. Because what if the network is even slower? You're going to start getting failures again. A much better solution is to use the built-in API called Wait for Existence. That way, I am I'm asking the UI test to wait for the title to appear and wait for five seconds. So I'm giving it, giving it a little bit more generous timeout. But the good thing here is that it doesn't need to wait for all those five seconds. It just needs to wait until the label appears on the screen. And that way, if we now update this test and we run it again, we're going to see here on the video what actually happens. So we get the dialogue again. We get the Mr. Loading Spinner appears. And what happens? We get Berlin. So now we have a good succeeding test without any waiting time, and everyone is happy. So now that we have solved our flakiness problems and we've gotten a little bit more stable tests, it's time to scale them up, right? That's what we always need to do, scale things. 
All right, so we have two tests right now. We have test onboarding and we have test adding city. Let's add a couple of more ones. You know, we get really hyped now. UI testing is awesome. Let's add more and more and more and more. Well, what we're going to see is that the more and more tests we add, it gets slower and slower and slower. And all of a sudden, we're waiting for one hour for a pull request to be mergeable, and it's, it's not very nice. So how can we fix this problem? Well, there are a couple of different angles we can take. And the first angle that I like to take is I like to do a couple of things to actually make the test quicker. The first thing we already talked about, to remove all sources of waiting time. If I'm just waiting for a test, like just sitting there waiting, that's just a waste of time. That's wasting my time, wasting other developers' time, it's wasting Xcode's time. No good. Let's remove all those waiting times and let's instead you know, be more um, deterministic about it. Another thing that I hinted at before was the fact that I try to remove duplicate paths. If I'm already verifying the onboarding flow in a separate test, I don't need to go to onboarding every single time I launch the app. If I'm already verifying that I can add a city, the next time I can just mock a city that is already added, so I don't need to retest that again and again and again. And the way I usually like to do that is to use launch arguments. That way I can add like a reset flag or a skip onboarding or a mocked cities flag, maybe use a mocked backend, anything that can make the test faster. And these kind of actions are not only good for UI tests, they're also great for debugging. If you want to set up your UI in a certain state, if you have some launch arguments that you can add in Xcode for that, that's super nice. And it really speeds up your development process. So that is a couple of tips how you can make the test actually quicker. But there's another thing that can make them easier to work with on a larger scale, and that is to use multiple test suites. Not every UI test needs to be run all the time. Some of them might be really important, and you need to run them on every single change, but some of them are kind of less important or less crucial or less prone to break. So you can do things like run your test nightly. For example, if you're using some CI service, you can set up like a cron job or a script or something, uh, or if you do a nightly build that runs the UI test maybe every night. You can also run them hourly so you get quicker feedback. If you like, have a bigger team, that might be a good idea, so you can act quicker on the test failures. You, of course, also want to run a set of tests on every PR to make sure that we don't cause regressions and so we can get feedback up front. But there's a fourth category of tests that I've started using more and more and more in my various projects, and that is to use tests that are dedicated for each developer. Now, this might sound a little bit interesting. I'm going to dive into it in a little bit. But the way we can set these up is we can use different UI testing bundles in Xcode, and that way we can tell Xcode, you know, if you're using Xcode build on the command line, or if we're using some CI or Fastlane or something, we can tell it to just run that unit testing bundle for, or that UI testing bundle for that specific scenario. So I mentioned this developer UI tests. What are those and how do I use them? Now to show you uh, how I use them, I want to give you a very quick demo and actually do something scary, run a UI test live here in front of like 300 people. So let's see how that's going to go. So let's jump over to Xcode. Uh, can you see this? It's good? Excellent. So you can see I have, I want to I wanna write a test for, or I, sorry, I'm working on a new feature. And this feature is to enable users to delete a city. So in order to work on this feature, every single time I'm making a change in the app, I need to go back, I need to go to the simulator, I need to launch the app, I need to add a city, I need to type Berlin or something, I need to add it, I need to wait for the server, I need to swipe it to remove it, I get a dialogue, are you sure? Yes, all right, cool. And then I have to keep going, keep going, keep going. And this can get really time consuming and frustrating and boring to have to do that every single time. Well, this is why we have computers, right? Let's get the computer to, to do this for us. Let's use a UI test. Here I have a development UI test. And this is part here of the development UI test bundle. This is a special bundle that only is for me. It's Git ignored, so it's only for my personal use. I can use it during development. The cool thing here is that if I go here and look at the scheme, you can see that I've mapped so that when I press Command U in Xcode, it only runs this dev, uh, dev UI test. It doesn't run all the UI tests, and it doesn't run the unit tests either. I can do that separately if I want to. So that way I can use these as like a script to actually automate my UI testing process, and it's pretty sweet. So in order to verify that my uh, remove cities feature works, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to 
add, as you can see here, I've added another launch argument, which is cities, and I've added Berlin and Stockholm. So I've added two cities up front, so I don't need to do that manually. Uh, I want to verify that I have two cities to begin with, Berlin and Stockholm. And then what I want to do, oh, not, not pounds. We're not in England, right? Um, I want to verify that I can swipe left on the first cell. That should reveal the, the Remove button. And then I want to tap the Remove button. And then I want to tap the Remove button on the Alert window that appears after the fact. And then finally, I just want to verify that things are as I expect. So I want to verify that I now only have one table view cell left after this happens. Now let me press Command U. Let's run over to the simulator. Uh, it's going to launch the UI test for me. And there we go. You know, we have to, to have a little sip of coffee or something while we wait. And then we see here we have this, the UI. It removes it. And that is way faster than I could ever do it. You know, so it's super nice in order to use these UI tests as like these kind of scripts for yourself. And then what's cool is that when I'm done with this feature, I can just take this test, I can copy and paste it into the real UI testing suite, and I have a UI test for free, which is really, really cool. So using UI tests for development can be really, really useful. All right, before we wrap up here, I just want to give you a couple of more quick tips. So first off, if you only want to UI test one thing, let's say now you haven't written any UI tests before and you want to get started, I think analytics is a great first candidate. I've written a blog post about this that I will link you later, and it's a great way to get started because analytics is something you need to work. It's very, very hard to verify manually, and if you're going to verify your analytics, you basically have to verify most of the app anyway, so you get, the, again, the biggest bang for the buck, the tactical deployment. Uh, there's a couple of ways that UI tests can be very hard to understand. We saw earlier in the, in the uh, error that we had in Xcode that it was a little bit hard to understand, hard to debug. So if you're struggling to figure out why an element can't be found or why something doesn't work, what you can do is you can print the query in the debugger. And that way you see the entire kind of trace of this query, how come it didn't find the element you expect, and what does your view hierarchy actually look like. There are a couple of things that are hard to UI test. For example, web views, if you have views that deal with sensors like the accelerometer or you know, location services, if you have interactions with other apps, those things are really hard to UI test. And again, tactical deployment, we don't need to use UI tests for everything. We can skip using UI tests for this stuff, and we can use other types of testing for that instead. And the final tip is that if you're ever blocked by an alert view, for example, if you have a system alert that pops up and it starts causing flakiness in your test, you can simply tap the app to make that go away. Just send a tap signal to the app and the alert will go away. And that can actually get rid of a lot of flakiness and it makes your test a lot more stable. So to recap today, what have we, what have we talked about? Well, first of all, we've talked about how we can tactically deploy UI tests. They're not for everything, and I don't think they should be completely ignored either. They're a great way to automate your, your testing for certain tasks or for certain things. If we have predictable states, for example, using mocking, using this reset flag, using these kind of development tools, we can really reduce flakiness. And if we can remove waiting time and we can wait for elements to appear, that also really helps. We can speed up our tests by streamlining them, not you, you testing the same thing over and over again. And we can split them up into multiple categories. And that way, we can also use UI testing as a development tool, as a scripting tool, which really, really helps and makes testing a lot more fun, less error prone, and faster as well. And that is the magic of UI testing. Thank you.